Hello, this is Matt on the Moon Lambo channel. Ripple CEO Brad Garlinghouse was interviewed on national television, Bloomberg TV, in fact, and the host confronted Brad Garlinghouse uh, with uh, uh, the fact that their in-house legal team, the Bloomberg lawyers, uh, they determined that Ripple's most likely to lose against the SEC uh, in this case. And I'm sitting there wondering if they know, like, even one twentieth of what the typical XRP holder knows about this case. I don't know how you come to such a conclusion. And I've said many times, like it is very difficult to find people, to find attorneys outside of the SEC that do believe that the SEC is right and that Ripple and XRP holders are wrong. It's very difficult to find those people. But when I do find them, oh, I'm happy to highlight them. The, in fact, the only other individuals I found, specifically attorneys, the only other attorneys that I've found were for, uh, members of the Anderson Kill Law Firm. And in the years leading up to this, they publicly made statements uh, disparaging Ripple and XRP specifically and making it clear that they do not like the XRP community. So go figure. Of course, they didn't think that uh, you know Ripple's on the right side of this or that XRP holders are on the right side of this. But now you've got legal analysts from Bloomberg TV indicating that they also think the SEC is right. So I've got comments on that in this video for you from uh, attorney John Deaton and attorney Jeremy Hogan also. And the question is also posed, okay, uh, what does this mean? Like, say everything goes to hell completely. Uh, say that Ripple actually loses the case. What does that mean for the price of XRP? What does that mean for the actual value of XRP? Well, I'm going to tell you what I think adoption for XRP might look like moving forward in such a scenario and what it would actually mean. Yes, for including the impacts on price and value. I'll just give you my personal perspective on that. Uh, so anyway, plenty to discuss. But before going further, I do want to be clear. I do not have a legal or financial background of any kind. I am not offering legal or financial advice. And you definitely should not buy or sell anything because of anything I say or write. I'm just an enthusiast who enjoys making YouTube videos about crypto-related topics, but just as a hobby and just for fun. Now, uh, if you hear this, you know the sound of that. That means I got some dead trees up in my little moon lambo hands. And what I did is I transcribed some of the parts from this interview that I found to be most interesting, and I'm going to share them with you now. And this was shared directly by the Bloomberg TV official Twitter account. And in the host... Uh, said the following, to kick this all off, said something, just the, the, even the first sentence or two, very interesting. Here's what the host said. Now joining us is Ripple CEO Brad Garlinghouse for an exclusive interview. Brad, it's great to get to speak to you. One of my favorite parts about doing this show, in particular, is that the audience is really engaged, and they always are tweeting things at us during the show, after the show, and the consistent question we get is when are you going to talk about Ripple and the SEC? Folks, congratulations to all of you out there, my fellow XRP community members that are all up on the Twitters, all of you that have been hitting like on all the stuff and tweeting at Bloomberg TV and everybody else in mainstream media, because uh, the vast majority of them not responding, not paying attention, they know you're there. Don't think that they're just not seeing this. Oh, they know you're there. So Bloomberg's been getting this for how long? And finally, they're addressing it. I mean, maybe they had another time. Well, in written format, they had. But on, on television here, um, this is not something that they're regularly talking about. And so, again, the host right here citing on her own that, man, we just are constantly getting bombarded by this. It's you listening to this that's doing that. So kudos to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm doing the same thing. I'm hitting like, I'm retweeting stuff. Um, we're, we're all doing that. But anyway, I wanted to highlight that just to point out, it does have an impact. They are listening. They are watching. And now they're getting at it and they are talking to Brad Garlow. So don't think for a second that doesn't matter. In fact, I'm going to expand upon that concept in a separate video. I just don't want to get too off track. But given that's how this interview began, I was like, I'd be remiss to not highlight that. I really would. Uh, and so shortly after that, Brad Garlinghouse said, the following, and he's referencing, of course, the, the lawsuit here. He said, the case has gone well. It's still playing out, you know. The SEC, in our judgment, has certainly moved slowly. Typically, in these situations, when the SEC brings the case, they want to move quickly. They have been dragging their feet, you know. Gary Gensler said recently, publicly, that justice delayed is justice denied. Unfortunately, justice is being delayed here by continuing efforts by the SEC to push things out. Yeah, well, that certainly couldn't be more obvious, right? <laughs> I 
How many times did the SEC ask for extensions and in, in the case and and get to them approved by the judge? And, and again, I'm not saying it's it's right or wrong necessarily. Maybe some of them were perfectly reasonable, but it seems like every single one got approved. And so that's why I've said many times it's my speculation. I just kind of I can't help but wonder at a minimum. Is it the case that in particular, especially with Judge Nor- uh, Netburn, was she just doing this to make the, the case uh, you know, a little bit closer to being appeal proof? Be, you know, give, give them what they want. OK, it's not going to actually change the outcome of how whatever the, the ruling is from Judge Torres. But uh, don't give them this and they have stronger grounds to appeal. Just, you know, try and like, not feed the monster effectively. It makes me wonder if that was part of the strategy. I don't know. Can't get inside, inside their heads, but can't help but wonder. This, this case has taken an enormous amount of time, much, much longer than what we were hoping or expecting from, you know, if you, I'll just say this. If you go back 12 months ago, if if you posited the idea of this case ending in March of 2023, people are like, oh, no, it'll be done before that. Uh, <laughs> think about that, because if you went back, you'd be like, ah, yeah, no, sorry, guys. It's going to be two more years, actually. <laughs> Yikes. Yeah, so it is what it is, though. Uh, and then uh, another host on the show said the following. OK, well, Brad... Oh, no, no, it's the same house, yeah. Okay, well, Brad, our litigation analysts here at Bloomberg Intelligence think that the SEC is going to win this. It's just an opinion. It's a hypothetical scenario. But in that scenario, how does Ripple move forward? Okay, pause. I'm going to share with you what Brad Garlinghouse has to say. Uh, and then I'm going to get into what uh, attorneys Hogan and Deaton had to say along with my thoughts on this. But I, I just, I can't help but wonder, like, to what degree are these analysts at Bloomberg paying attention if they actually think the SEC is on the right side of this thing. I just, it makes me wonder, like, are, are, are these interns? Like, <laughs> I don't literally mean that, but come on. Uh, and so here, here's what here's what Mr. Garlinghouse had to say. I think the Howey test is being stretched beyond recognition. It's a 1946 Supreme Court case. So the idea that XRP, which we use as a currency, the idea that it's a security, I think is just misguided. Unfortunately, Ripple is already operating in a world where it's as if we have lost. In the United States, XRP has for all intents and purposes, uh, there is no liquidity. Trading has been halted on most exchanges, despite the fact that Ripple had a record year last year. We continue to grow very quickly across our major product groups. Even Q1 was a record for us. Now, unfortunately, almost all that growth is coming from outside the United States, and we are hiring more and more people outside the United States. But our customer base now is about 95% non-United States payments companies. Think about this. So Ripple's, and he'd actually previously stated, Brad had stated that they'd actually lost customers, some customers in the United States to the point where now only 5% of their customers are in the United States. Is that a surprise given what's been going on? Well, I sure as hell don't think so. Uh, but but he's right here. Where's the opportunity when uh, nobody's nobody's allowed to... I mean, with rare exception, what like Uphold, you can go buy and sell it there. There's, there's like three places in the entire country where you can. But outside of that, uh, good luck. <laughs> good luck. You're not going to be able to get it, so you can't, you can't use it. Um, and then there was a, a little bit later on, Brad Garlinghouse said the following... Uh, The demand for our core product, which uses XRP to facilitate these cross-border payments, the demand for that grew 8x year over year. So from Q1 last year to Q1 this year, it grew 8x. And that's off a base already measured in the billions. So from our point of view, demand has skyrocketed. I just think it's incredibly frustrating that here in the United States, where we have led innovation in so many different industries... We have an agency that is overreaching and really constraining competitiveness in hiring people here in the United States. Yeah, and I'm going to come back to circle around to that comment because um, that's that's amazing. So what he's talking about there, that is representative of utility. The fact that there's an eightfold increase year over year with on-demand liquidity utilizing XRP as a bridge currency, that's because it's helping people in businesses. That's the reason that's happening. Cryptocurrencies that help people in businesses, they don't go away. They're not going to. That's my firm belief. People, when there's, when there's value in something, which is different than price, when there's actual value, humans don't just discard that typically. They recognize the value, and then money chases the value. Price go up. That's my, that's my expectation here. 
That's incredible. You don't see this with almost any cryptocurrencies on the entire planet. Real world adoption. Um, and then also I'll, I'll cite this too. Here's a very short quote from Brad. It was a little bit later in the interview. He said, the CFTC is the most appropriate regulator, uh, regulator for this industry. So he doesn't even seem to think that the SEC necessarily should be involved. And by and large, I, I tend to agree. I mean, there, there, there can be exceptions. Like, And it's not that the... Look, here's where they should come in. Here, here's what I want to say on this. I, I think we'd probably all, all agree on this. As, as much as we don't like the SEC and we know that they are a bunch of asshats engaging in like just endless quantities of asshattery, if they are going to go after outright frauds and scams, we I think we'd probably all agree, yes, go ahead and do that, asshats. I, I get it. Go, go ahead. Just asshats have at it because I would like the asshats to do something that's actually productive. But, but the rest of it, just by and large, no. If there's a cryptocurrency and it's decentralized, uh, so meaning there can't be a common enterprise then, it doesn't satisfy the Howey test clearly. The SEC has no jurisdiction over it at that point. It has none whatsoever. So, yeah, in that case, the CFTC does seem to be a much more reasonable place to go ahead and have this regulated. Um, now, here is what attorney Jeremy Hogan had to say upon uh, viewing this interview for himself. He, he wrote the following on Twitter. At the 10-minute mark of this interview, Brad is asked about the possibility of losing the lawsuit and says, quote, Ripple is already operating in a world where it's as if it had lost, end quote. That one made me think for a couple minutes. So let me just pause. Uh, and and I, I did read that quote. I actually transcribed that portion right there. But think about that. It is true. Because right now, if Ripple loses, what happens? There's no liquidity in the United States. United States customers don't really want to touch any product utilizing XRP. Okay. Well, that, that's what's happening right now. Like, that's already the case. So they're operating as if they're a business, as if that were the case. That's why, thankfully, they're, they're growing internationally leaps and bounds. It's incredible. Uh, now, Jeremy did expand because apparently some people were... Um, uh, you know, kind of wondering why is it so cryptic here? Because uh, he, he he just wrote, that one made me think for a couple of minutes, but he didn't expand in that initial tweet. And so then he said, sorry, I didn't mean to be cryptic. My main thought was that, um, my main thought was that XRP's price, uh, XRP's pricing uh, already has a ripple loss baked in. There's no difference between now and a loss in March. And he's, he's not saying that will happen. He wrote that in parentheses even. If you hold XRP, a loss doesn't change its value, but imagine a win. So on that point, I'll, I'll say the following. The, uh, the, the price of XRP would likely dip much lower if Ripple loses, um, even if that's just temporary. Why? Not because XRP historically has followed you know, what, what happens with Ripple. It hasn't. But the SEC is insisting that it should, and the market's taking note of that. So it's because of the SEC, not because of Ripple. There's a distinct difference there. So yes, I think it's reasonable to speculate that if that scenario happens, which I don't think is likely, but if it does, uh, yeah, price is probably going to dip quite a bit, even if it's just for a short period of, period of time. But um, you know, the, the utility of XRP has already been reduced for this use case, thanks to the SEC's lawsuit drying up United States liquidity. So um, if a loss does occur for Ripple, that part, again, like I said, doesn't change. The value, which is different than price, won't decrease further. In fact, in, in such a scenario, what's likely is that Ripple will continue to use XRP as a bridge currency for every other corridor on the planet that doesn't touch the United States. For corridors that do touch the United States, Ripple's only recourse may be to use a cryptocurrency other than XRP, that has not yet been destroyed by the SEC. And, and by the way, this is not me just uh, randomly speculating. Um, there's a little bit more to it than that. In fact, uh, this is something that Ripple CEO Brad Garlinghouse has talked about in the past and has not ruled out. And so no matter what, there's going to be a path forward. Uh, you know, and it'll, it'll be concerning to me here in the United States if I don't have an easy way to sell XRP. I don't know for sure what the legal implications for someone like me in the United States would be if the worst happened. But XRP is not going to go away just because of the SEC. The rest of the world has already said, no, we like this. We're going to keep using it as a bridge currency. That, that's what you Again, eightfold increase while all this nonsense is happening. The rest of the world is like, OK, whatever. Well, we're going to use it because Rip, Ripple's helping to build out that ecosystem. And again, that represents value. So it does seem to me at this point, even if the worst happens in the United States, I'd have to find out what the legal implications would be and the tax implications. And in addition to that, if, they, if there might be a change as a result of all this, I have no idea. But for me here in the United States, I'd research that if the worst happened. And it would depend on what the ruling was, so I can't even really research it now. You can have some guesses depending on what might happen. 
but I'd have to take a look at that and see if there's any way that I can move that to another jurisdiction with that. I would never want, I would not break the law here in the United States, but if there's something I could do in order to offload it, sell it somewhere else, and then convert that somehow back into dollars and then invest that elsewhere. That's what I'd have to try and figure out. Now, even then though, I wouldn't really be interested in doing that until, you know, there's some parabolic movement to the upside. <laughs> so we'll see. Um, and then there was also this. There's a guy here that goes by the name Welfare Millionaire on Twitter, and he shared this little screen grab here, which uh, for those of you that aren't driving, feel free to take a look. Um, he wrote, "What?" Uh, but it was this look Brad Garlinghouse gave her at around the 9 minute 56 second mark when she said that the litigation team at Bloomberg thinks the SEC will win the case that made me think for a minute. Jeremy Hogan, what do you make of that legal team's assumption? And Mr. Hogan did respond and said the following. I've never said Ripple is going to win or lose. That's because we, the public, have only seen like 10 to 15% of the evidence so far. How Bloomberg's legal eagles can make that determination is beyond me. Maybe they have hacked the SEC's computers and can see all the evidence. And of course, he's just joking with that last little bit there, but that's a good point. Uh, and it's interesting. So I, I admit that we don't know for sure anything but all of the pre-trial information that's come out looks very good for Ripple, by and large, and by and large does not look so hot for the SEC. So based on the publicly available, available information, it's very lopsided in favor of Ripple. That's my personal unprofessional opinion, but that's really what it looks like. And, and I'm telling you, if things looked horrendous, I'd be sounding the alarms of that. I'd be like, guys, is there anything else that we can do as a community to push even harder I, I, I we do or at least discuss it and figure okay, there's something else to be done, but I'm, I'm not seeing that. So it's it's not me just sitting here in an XRP echo chamber being like, oh, everything's that's fine. No, I'm looking at the actual evidence, and if, if I didn't think that it looked favorable at this point for XRP holders, I would be expressing much greater concern. So it's not that there's not risk in holding XRP. I'm not saying that, there, that we shouldn't be concerned. Of course, we should be concerned. I'm just saying. It could be much, much, much worse. That's what I'm getting at here. Uh, and then there was this from Wilbur54XRP, who wrote the following. In an interview with Brad Garlinghouse on Bloomberg Crypto, the host told Brad Garlinghouse, to his surprise, that their Bloomberg litigation analysts think that the SEC is going to win. What a stupid statement to make to listening investors. And how far removed from the case are they? And I'm, that last part I'm wondering. How much do they actually know? Are they just saying stuff and they're not well-researched or are they well-researched to what degree they understand crypto and blockchain? Do they understand centralized versus decentralized check not technology and how that can change from one to the other and then even back again? Do they get all of this stuff? And then how that would apply to the, the, the Howey analysis? They better understand the freaking Howey test, okay? But anyway, attorney Deaton retweeted that and wrote the following. I guarantee you the lawyer who said this knows very little about the case and gives very stupid reasons for having that opinion. Things like the SEC only brings cases it can win. <laughs> no kidding. Because the, the facts and circumstances are not on the side of the SEC. Again, everything that we've seen publicly to this point. <sighs> Interesting stuff. But uh, again, I'm still very optimistic here. I am not a financial advisor. You should not buy or sell anything because of anything I say or write. That would be a very, very, very bad idea. Until next time, to the moon Lambo.